Hello and welcome. My name is Dr. Gerard Toll and this is a lecture on Wendy Brown's book Wall States Waning Sovereignty which was published by Zone Books. Um, this lecture is part of my course Topics in Political Geography which is being offered in the spring of 2014 at Virginia Tech. Now this book is a um, work of political theory and Wendy Brown is a professor of political theory at the University of California in Berkeley. Um, this book is uh, a book that she published in 2010 and uh, she has subsequently published a book on doing the demos, neoliberalism stealth revolution um, uh, from Zone uh, Books also. All right, let's talk a little bit about this uh, book. So um, even though it was published in 2010, it is uh, extremely relevant uh, to the contemporary period, and that's one of the reasons why I assigned it. Um, so let's talk about how the book is organized. There's four chapters. It begins by looking at certain kind of empirics and paradoxes, as she sees it, of sovereignty in the contemporary period. And then there is the core theoretical discussion in chapter two um, of various political theorists and thinkers on the question of sovereignty. Uh, then chapter three deals with the uh, question of subjects and uh, subjectification, the making of subjects, the making of the polity in conditions where you have states that are uh, engaged in the construction of border walls. And then chapter four is a reading of uh, the desire and need for border walls, even though they manifestly do not um, fulfill the uh, particular purposes that they're meant to uh, fulfill. Why, why, nevertheless, do we still have borders and this still this desire for it? And she provides an analysis of this using some psychoanalytic analytic theory. Uh, and, uh, and so you have that particular discussion uh, at the end of the book. Now, the book throughout is a dialogue with, uh, in particular, Carl Schmitt, uh, and to a lesser extent, uh, Giorgio Agamben. There's also discussion of the work of Michael Hart and Antonio Negri as well. Uh, besides, there's also a kind of discussion of the classics of political theory. Now, Carl Schmitt uh, was a Nazi era a political thinker, a, a critic of liberalism, and someone whose work uh, has enjoyed a revival over the last uh, 25 years or so. In particular, uh, the book Political Theology, uh, which is, all of these are rather short books, but the book Political Theology looks at the ways in which the contemporary modern understandings of sovereignty are underpinned by theological understandings. Uh, Schmidt, you should uh, know, was uh, a conservative Catholic himself, um, and he was particularly sensitive to the ways in which uh, God and notions of uh, the religious work themselves out even in ostensibly secular societies. Uh, Schmidt is famous for his book, The Concept of the Political, which, uh, which he defines as uh, the determination of uh, friend and enemies. And then there's another book, uh, The Nomos of the Earth, uh, which is also discussed by um, Wendy Brown, and that is one that uh, came out later, and it is very much about uh, the geopolitical and the uh, bounding of the earth, and that's uh, an inspiration for her work as well. So there's a particular dialogue with, with Schmidt's work. Now, because Schmidt is a conservative uh, thinker who endorsed Nazism, that does not mean that therefore her work does the same or her work is, um, is necessarily tainted in any way by that. Um, in actuality, what she's seeking to do is to take on this critic of liberalism and look at his particular ideas. Uh, Martin Heidegger is another kind of figure too. And the ideas that they are, uh, the arguments that they're making are in and of themselves extremely important and separate from the particular person. Uh, 
so that's important to to my uh, to keep in mind. Um, now there is a discussion of a Gamben because a Gamben was someone who helped stimulate the revival of Schmidt's work uh, by going back and looking at uh, it and finding notions such as the state of exception uh, and so on and so forth. Um, Antonio Negri and, and Michael Hart in their book Empire and another book Multitude uh, are coming out of a more Marxist tradition, but they're also engaging with um, these thinkers. Now, Foucault is in the background and the idea of biopolitics, which we've discussed uh, uh, already, is in the background. And that's something that Agamben uh, addresses explicitly, Antonio Negri uh, and Michael Hart also address explicitly too. Um, okay, so let's talk a about the book uh, and talk about that sort of introductory chapter in which she lays out the different uh, paradoxes of globalization and I've tried to provide you with a visualization of these um, and the ways in which we live in a moment where you, there's an opening yet a blocking there's a, a desire or articulation of universal discourses yet there's also uh, exclusionary discourses there's a move towards virtual networks while there's also a need to construct barricades and so on and so forth um, and in certain instances, these two discourses are sitting together in the same political party or even in the same uh, figure, um, the political uh, politician and, and the like. And so that's in and of itself is quite interesting. So there's a lot of uh, really good stuff at the beginning here in which she lays out uh, her thesis. In fact, there's quite a bit of repetition in the in the book and her laying out the particular thesis that she wants to articulate. So let's have a look at uh, some of that. Um, so she discusses, for example, page 25 on the theatricalized and spectacularized performance of sovereignty at the aspiration or actual national borders brings into relief in the nation state's sovereignty's theological remainder, its sort of legacy, its leftover. And that's very much in dialogue with the arguments of Schmidt. Um, uh, throughout here. Um, okay, so uh, what are some of the arguments that she makes? Well, um, she wants to argue that, or sh she discusses the ways in which sovereignty is described by Schmidt and by others. And it's got a series of different uh, qualities um, in that it is territorial or spatial, it's supposed to be supreme, There's a, uh, it is supposed to be protective, it's in perpetuity, it's absolutist, it's non-transferable, uh, it's decisionist. And decisionist meaning that there are, there are certain decisions made, uh, there is a, um, a particular protector or god-like figure who decides on what to do, and because that person is making the decisions, therefore um, um, things get done, and uh, this, uh, this, the kind of mythos of sovereignty, at least in Rousseau and others, is that you have a social contract, and this is also goes back to um, to Hobbes. You have a social contract in which the people hand the uh, their particular uh, representation to a sovereign and the sovereign makes decisions on behalf of the community as a whole. Um, so that's um, the kind of qualities of sovereignty. And what's important here is the ways in which they carry over from the older understanding of sovereignty as something as residing in a person, a disordered divine like person, to then carries over into a more modern conception of sovereignty residing in the people coming from the nation. Now, what she wants to look at is, uh, and is kind of animated by, why is there a need to um, create walls uh, in the contemporary period? Why is there a desire for walls? And um, she describes our current condition as a post-Westphalian one uh, in that um, we have the Westphalian system, which is created in 1648. 
or at least that's the mythos uh, that there is a point in which uh, you have the breakdown of the sort of aspirations of uh, the universal church, universal Catholic church in um, uh, in Europe. Uh, it's a sort of the moment when the Reformation uh, gets tamed. That's a moment when a uh, states decide their own religion uh, and the sovereign within the state decides the religion of the community there um, and that's the particular um, uh, sort of deal uh, that struck that creates the Westphalian system um, and the, um, the myth is that therefore you have territorial nation states you have one territory one community one state um, now that doesn't ever really get realized in practice. Uh, the closest we get to it is sort of the in the twentieth century, but even that, and you know, we're still sort of working this out. But um, with globalization, we are already aware that we are in uh, a, an era where we're past that, and where borders are supposed to be less significant. Uh, we're in an era where we're supposed to have uh, uh, an appreciation of uh, connectivity and community beyond the nation state. Um, but as she points out, the post here is one that is not beyond. It is one that's still very much in the shadow of and very much uh, pivoting around this myth of the Westphalian state. Um, and she talks about the ways in which there is a certain irony to a post-Westphalian condition. Uh, you have um, the ero marked erosion of nascent state sovereignty. And at that very moment, you have the desire to create walls. She doesn't think that is uh, coincidental. That's, those two, two things are related as far as she's concerned. You have performative contradictions of this theatrical a desire for sovereignty expressing itself in a uh, wall in material forms in the creation of walls um, yet um, there is also globalization occurring at the same time you have a rise of an un condition of ungovernability the ability of states to actually manage global change uh, is significantly in question because of the technological innovations, because of the nature of the world that we live in. Um, and so that's another feature of our contemporary condition. And then you have the, this blurring of the law and lawlessness uh, as another feature uh, of this uh, post-Westphalian condition. So what is sovereignty uh, in the 21st century? Uh, what is post-Westphalian sovereignty? What does it look like? And that's really the question that she's sort of asking here. Um, now, on the one hand, Hart and Negri give the answer, uh, post-Westphalian sovereignty is global empire. It is um, a sort of an empire of um, governmentality based around uh, neoliberalism, and based around a, a kind of a vision of uh, the world as the United States. Uh, so it's very much an Americanized, uh, Americanized uh, vision of how the world should be gone global, uh, which involves notions of intervention and uh, protection, uh, a responsibility to protect and the like. The alternative to that is the, uh, what Agamben is arguing for, and that is that we live in a world where uh, we have a permanent state of exception, where the law is suspended, where there's a strong divide between those that live in a condition of bare life and those that are protected. And the, uh, the state is an interventionist one which um, uh, intervenes to keep certain people in a condition of bare life and protect others. Um, and she comes down in this by talking about the fact that today we have in practical terms sovereignty, meaning the rule of uh, oligarchic uh, capitalist groups uh, and also God, uh, states acting in the name of God. And this is, of course, her book is 
pre-Trump, but Trump is sort of articulates this, or at least Trump Pence articulates this, because Trump, on the one hand, is kind of a classic oligarch um, figure uh, who is internationalized. Uh, his business empire is, is international. Uh, his ties are made uh, in China and elsewhere overseas. And yet he is, uh, though, a very, very unlikely figure to be uh, someone who would uh, underpin a theological conception of, of the state. He's nevertheless allied with the Christian right and Mike Pence uh, represents that alliance. And though, therefore, you have the rule of uh, the oligarchs and, and God, uh, God talkers. Now, other states uh, represent this too. And so you have uh, Turkey, Iran, uh, Israel uh, and so on and so forth that uh, combine in certain ways and it, uh, also Russia combine in certain ways these two qualities together um, so that's what she points to but it's a sort of a uh, it's not a fleshed out thesis it's a particular argument that she makes in distinction to these others um, in, in the text so those are some uh, observations about uh, the first chapter. Now the second chapter is really the engine of the theoretical engine of the book and here she is engaging with Schmidt's work uh, and she's looking at the ways in which the uh, the meaning of sovereignty changes um, that the idea of the sovereign becomes sovereignty as an abstraction as a sort of imagination of popular uh, rule um, and that um, you have movement from divine sovereignty where it is presumed that kind of the dominant fiction of the society is that the ruler is semi-divine and uh, therefore represents God on earth and therefore is sort of untouchable. So the, the idea of the czar, for example, or the sultan and, uh, and the absolute right of kings in, in Europe. Um, so that particular type of sovereignty uh, then ga giving over to state sovereign power, the development of the modern state, the kind of themes that Foucault develops. And this in part is about uh, popular sovereignty. It's in part about the French Revolution and the, um, the locating of sovereignty in the people. But again, another sort of an abstraction is, well, who are the people and, and how do they exercise their particular sovereignty? Um, and uh, Schmidt really explores that uh, in a very, very productive way. And then we're moving to this post-Westphalian and condition, and that's the question in the book and the uh, concern. What is the post-Westphalian uh, condition of, of sovereignty? What, what does sovereignty mean in the contemporary period? Now, what unites all of these understandings of sovereignty is that sovereignty is always seen as sort of fictional. It's, it is a story we tell ourselves about how our society is organized and uh, how we give legitimacy to our uh, political system. So there's a sort of fictional quality to it. There's a theatrical quality to it in terms of uh, the display of this sovereignty. You know, the display of uh, the divine right of kings, then the display of uh, popular sovereignty with elections and so on and so forth. And the particular uh, dates that are uh, dates of commemoration of uh, independence and freedom uh, that are celebrated by various states. And then the contemporary period where we celebrate certain universal ideals and notions of universal human rights and, and so on and so forth. Women's Day, etc., etc. Um, there's a, so there's a posited universal commonality. And it, what uh, she also argues, and this is something that Schmidt um, articulates too, is that there, uh, in uh, constituting a sovereign community, there's a notion that um, the sovereign is protecting. The sovereign is a fatherly figure. The sovereign is containing, the sovereign is integrating and creating a community, and the sovereign is excluding otherness. And so in all of these instances, you have in the display of the, um, the notion of sovereignty, you have this, uh, this occurring. So there is a, a, 
a sort of father principle, Führer principle, a uh, protective principle, principle at work. And she, uh, throughout the book, um, but particularly in the last chapter, uh, comes back to this sort of primal notion of a uh, human vulnerability uh, in a world of uh, tremendous dangers and risks and uncertainties, and how that uh, psychically, how humans process that by creating a sovereign and endowing a particular figure to to look after them, to to be the father protector and that sort of that condition of infantile helplessness which is a condition that all human beings experience provides the foundations for this a sort of at an unconscious level the foundations for the notion of sovereignty that's why it resonates with us because we all want to have something to look up to. Some, we all want the fantasy that someone is looking after us, that someone is protecting, uh, and so on and so forth. Initially, that's a particular person, and then it becomes the state. And in the contemporary period, it is um, uh, perhaps a super state uh, or an alliance of states uh, and sets of, of ideals. Uh, and a sort of a religious uh, creed associated with uh, uh, human rights and, uh, and so on and so forth. So this chapter discusses uh, the nomos, um, uh, which is this idea of enclosure as the sort of foundational movement of sovereignty. Uh, with enclosure, you have the creation of the law, you have the creation of the sacred and the sovereign and all of those things. Uh, in Schmidt's account uh, are linked and in so doing in bounding uh, you know in the first act of creating the sovereignty is he who decides and he who decides is the person who uh, determines where the community ends uh, what is sacred and what is not who are who are we as a community of friends and who are our enemies um, now there's a discussion of how um, this is a deeply territorial from the outset. So there's this is in uh, Hobbes's work. This is in English history, particularly the colonization of Ireland, where the idea of beyond the pale, meaning that's the sort of the era, uh, the era of lawlessness, and that's a particular phrase which we have. But there actually was materially a geographic area which I've shown here on the map, uh, which was beyond the pale. And was literally, that was the area of uh, the Irish Gaelic uh, lords and uh, wild peoples, uh, according to the, the English uh, settlers who were settling in the area of contemporary Dublin and Kildare and uh, Meath. Uh, and there was a, actually a fence uh, which uh, marked out this same... Um, 15th and 16th century polity which then expanded out um, later in the 16th century and then and the 17th century took over the whole island and uh, cleared certain areas for for settlement particularly the Ulster plantation um, all right so that is uh, the kind of discussion that you have in this particular chapter let me just point out that the Gamben's work on the state of exception is in where when you have the the boundary between the law and the lawless uh, lawlessness begin to break down, uh, and in fact, you know, this comes out of Schmidt's work, and that is that he wants to argue that um, the development of the modern uh, sovereign state, uh, as he who decides, uh, it, it has a particular feature to it. And that is that the God sovereign and the state sovereign are both determined, both um, share this um, enclosure, this desire to create borders around things, to, uh, to define an inside and an outside, and in Schmidt's terms, friend and enemy. Um, but importantly for Schmidt, state sovereignty has a dual quality to it. We have the idealized sense of it that it is sovereignty of the people, 
Um, but he wants to point out that in actuality, there is also the state itself and there's a decisionist feature of the state and that is those who are in charge of the state who make decisions, who all, who can uh, deploy the army, who control the police and the like. And they have uh, a, a vested interest themselves. That's part of modern state sovereignty. That's where sovereignty in his in Schmidt's terms really resides. It really resides with the person who decides and that be, that becomes the king and later the president uh, or the prime minister, the person who is elected to to ultimately be the protector. Uh, and part of the feature of the sovereign is that the sovereign gets to decide when to suspend the law uh, and the sovereign is above the law the sovereign uh, the law does not apply to the sovereign because the sovereign guarantees the law and the sovereign decides what the law is and what the law is not um, so he who uh, creates the state of exception is the sovereign uh, and it and that law depends upon uh, f a person or a figure being outside of the law in order to enforce it. So that particular paradox, which is in Schmidt, uh, well, it's in political theory writ large, as she points out in this chapter, um, Schmidt takes out and kind of brings to the fore in a, in a very uh, provocative way. Um, because Schmidt is not a liberal. Schmidt is someone who is very critical of liberalism and sees it as very hypocritical in lots of ways because it does not recognize this particular dilemma. It does not recognize the need for a decider, the need for decisionism. Um, and remember, Schmidt is reacting against the Weimar Republic, uh, which was notoriously uh, feckless in its inability to handle the crisis that afflicted um, post-war uh, Germany, post-World War I uh, Germany. Um, so you have this dual quality to, the, um, uh, to sovereignty in the uh, modern era. Now, uh, this then leads her to identify a series of different paradoxes with sovereignty. Uh, so let's discuss some of these. Um, um, I have highlighted some uh, parts of the text here, uh, and I'm just kind of going to go through them uh, and get to this section on um, these paradoxes. So uh, this is page 53. Um, uh, so sovereignty is both a name for absolute power and a name for political freedom. Um, and that's that dual quality. Sovereignty generates order through subordination and freedom through autonomy. Sovereignty is no internal essence, but rather is completely dependent and relational, even as it stands for autonomy, self-presence and self-sufficiency. Uh, so there's always an outside. Uh, there is an other. Uh, there is across the border. Uh, the, there's a lawlessness, uh, which defines then the, the internal. Sovereignty produces both internal hierarchy uh, and external anarchy. Um, both um, hierarchy and anarchy are at odds with democracy if the latter is understood as a modestly egalitarian sharing of power. Um, yet with rare exceptions, political theorists take sovereignty to be a necessary feature of political life. The very possibility of political action, political order and political protection seems to depend on it. Um, and then uh, number five, uh, sovereignty is both a sign of the rule and jurisdiction of law and super, uh, supervenes the law. Or sovereignty is both the source of law and above the law, the origin of juridicalism and what resides outside it. It is all law and no law. It's every utterance is law and it is lawless. Sovereignty is also both generative, uh, generated and generative. Um, and then the theological aspect of sovereignty is the internal uh, condition of the secular notion of the autonomy of the political articulated by and through sovereignty. Uh, and so he, she goes on to explain exactly what that means. 
Um, so those are hard notions, perhaps, if you are not too familiar with political theory, but uh, go with it, uh, give it a chance so that you can uh, get a lot out of this book. There is a lot in it. Uh, so let's talk about um, the, um, the state and what she is talking about in terms of uh, <clears throat> what's happening when they, you go from a modern condition of sovereignty to post-Westphalian sovereignty. And that is the state uh, in the, West, the Westphalian state, the myth of Westphalian state, is that it contained economic networks which were previously uh, transnational. Uh, uh, it sort of defined an economy which was within the state. And it also contained religious networks uh, which were previously um, uh, universal. Uh, and there's also tension between religion and the the state and in some instances that was worked out by the state establishing its own religion so the church of england being a classic example of this uh, the crown she discusses the crown as currency as a way in which uh, the economic is mastered by the state so you have that notion um as being a sort of a tilting of power away from the economic and the religious into the hands of the state, into the hands of the sovereign. Now, now you have a condition uh, with globalization of decontainment, and that is those things which were previously contained, like religious networks, uh, like economic networks, are suddenly strengthened again, and the state no longer seems like it is able to uh, be, be sovereign relative to the appeal of uh, religious networks. Now, this plays itself out really very obviously in, in Trump's America. So his critique of globalization is that uh, globalization is eroding the foundations of the state. It is American carnage. Uh, it's a geopolitical catastrophe for the state. And then uh, his attempt to institute a Muslim ban is, uh, um, is sourced in the notion that... Um, that the particular religious identity of one community, and this is an, uh, an old I ideal, an old prejudice, is therefore going to be much more significant than their uh, loyalty to a particular community, to a particular territory in a particular community. So uh, American Muslim, the Muslim is more important than the American in this particular instance. Now he's sort of refolding uh, or redefining the state uh, at the United States in this instance as a um, Christian, uh, as a Christian nation. Uh, so there's that sort of return to, to a God, a particular vision of God. Um, though that the condition of decontainment is what she's discussing in, in this particular chapter. Chapter three deals with the uh, subjects and uh, the nature of the subjects created by the um, this condition of uh, walling, this desire for walling, and she discusses the um, the Minutemen, uh, which are sort of self-appointed vigilante groups on the U.S. border, uh, the particular uh, settler groups in um, Israel Palestine. Uh, and the particular violence surrounding the uh, creation of the borders and the, uh, the desire to uh, patrol and maintain borders. Now, there's a large literature on this, and there are various operations that, uh, um, that are uh, discussed in this literature. So um, the two that I would recommend to you uh, Ayal Wiseman's book on the architecture of occupation in Israel Palestine, and then Nevin's, uh, Joseph Nevin's book, uh, Operation Gatekeeper. And actually, he has a subsequent book, uh, Beyond Operation Gatekeeper. But that's the uh, ways in which you have the emergence of, uh, in biopolitical terms, of this uh, the, the terrorist in the, uh, the Hamas terrorist in the. Uh, in the Israeli case, the suicide bomber, and then the illegal alien in the in the U.S. Uh, as the, as an other, which is uh, creates the justification for this particular desire for um, for these border walls. 
Um, you uh, have a discussion of Jersey barriers here and the ways in which this uh, walling impulse is one that um, exceeds the border. It, it goes into uh, cities and how we design cities. It's, it's about gated communities. It's about created, creating a hardened space. Uh, and so the work of uh, Stephen Graham is particularly interesting in this. Uh, his, uh, his previous book was Cities Under Siege and his new book is called Vertical, which is the city uh, as, um, as, a, as an arena for stratification and hardening and uh, class warfare in, in many instances in, in his analysis. So um, that is uh, some of the points that uh, are made in um, chapter three of the book. Uh, here are some things that I have uh, highlighted uh, and this is her claim, uh, this is page 62, as the nation state sovereignty wanes both internal and external performances of it are increasingly and openly dressed in religious regalia. And that's the uh, taken from Schmidt, the ways in which the religious is still very much powerful in our contemporary period. So um, these are uh, the points that she makes here. Now, in this uh, chapter three, there's one section I want to draw your attention to, and that is the uh, quote by Peter Andreas, where he, uh, and this is where Wendy Brown uses the, the, his a reaction to this trope, which is we hear again and again, we've lost control of our borders. We need to control our borders again. This is the sort of, um, harangue of Nigel Farage in England, the leading Brexit campaigner, and of course of Donald Trump in the United States. And Andreas argues that the, this understates the degree to which the state has, ac has actually structured, conditioned, and even enabled, often un unintentionally, clandestine border crossings, and overstates the degree to which the state has been able to control its borders in the past. And that is that that particular powerful trope, lost control of our borders, has behind it a whole political economy which uh, encouraged cross-border uh, movement. Uh, and um, then also has a, not only that, a, a, a failure to uh, address that political economy, but a uh, also a mythos, a mythos of the glorious past, the past when we were ourselves and there weren't so many outsiders. Uh, and so there's a sort of nostalgia which goes along with this particular claim uh, that I think is important and part of the, the structure of feeling here uh, in, in, in this particular instance. So chapter four deals with the psychic dimensions of uh, the border uh, and the will to bordering. And she uh, outlines it um, here uh, in the beginning of the chapter. Uh, the, sh the chapter argues that nation states walling respond in part to psychic fantasies, anxieties and wishes and does so by generating visual effects and a national imaginary apart from what walls purport to do. Walls may be effective in producing this psychic containment even as they fail to block or, re or repeal the transnational clandestine flows of people. And so that's an important point. And essentially what she's saying is that, that these borders have a certain fetish-like quality to them. And uh, Brown's feminist um, um, reading and background is very apparent in this particular chapter uh, where she is aware and of the ways in which you have a, a subject here who is feeling um, um, a masculinity under stress, a masculinity under threat uh, and a desire to remasculinize. Uh, uh, to put some steel in the uh, in the border again, and so that is a particular psychic condition. It's a psychic condition um, grounded in a masculinity and a hegemonic uh, masculinity dominant within certain states, and that's certainly the case in in, in many places. Uh, and um, and it's a fetish. It is uh, it is something that. Even though we know that this doesn't work, we it still satisfies at a certain level. 
and there is a phallic quality to the border uh, that, and how high the border is and uh, it's sort of a visually reinf- reassuring um, to certain groups and that um, that is a part of what she argues here um, and of course all of this writing is prior to Trump so she wrote this book in 2008 and 2009 um, and uh, then Trump comes along and uses this particular notion to uh, to uh, to win the presidency now, uh, in this chapter, she discusses various fantasies of wall democracy, uh, and it's a really very provocative and interesting analysis. Uh, here are the four that are listed. Dangerous aliens, the idea of containment, uh, fantasies of impermeability, and fantasies of purity, innocence, and goodness. So, for example, um, the idea that uh, the American carnage would end uh, when you build a border wall and the American carnage may be the uh, ravaging of American communities by heroin and drugs. And the, the notion is that if we just cut off the supply at the wall uh, by building a wall, therefore we can um, somehow restore our health our purity and our innocence. And, and of course, that is completely counterintuitive in as much as the, the reason why there are, bo- there are drugs uh, going across the border in the first place is because of the massive demand for them in the United States. And that demand comes from uh, addiction and dependency. Uh, and um, uh, that in and of itself is something that's not examined. It's pro- the, the, the failure uh, of that, what that says about U.S. society, is projected onto uh, to the outside, to Mexico. The problem is Mexican drug cartels and dealers and so on and so forth and uh, you know it's fairly fairly straightforward and and and, uh, and kind of empirically uh, evident uh, but psychically it uh, is not appealing in this as a walls are appealing to a certain group uh, as as solutions the very end of this chapter she discusses the ways in which walls are meant to awe that they are sort of temples uh, in a uh, post uh, Westphalian sovereignty. That um, a- and of course there are connections. So you think of the Wailing Wall in Jerusalem, um, and then the the barrier walls just not that far from the Wailing Wall, um, and the Wailing Wall being the most sacred site uh, in of Judaism. And uh, how walls uh, today have a certain uh, sacredness associated with them. Uh, And she provides us with a reading uh, of Freud uh, to talk about the ways in which they are um, these kind of objects that uh, that create awe and that uh, are seen as sort of uh, solutions to um, conditions of helplessness. Let's talk about some uh, problems with uh, Wendy Brown's book. Um, this is political theory, and political theory versus social science, these things don't often uh, go well together. Um, so there are a lot of speculative abstractions of theory here, um, and there's not that much uh, or less discussion of empirical history. So contrast that to uh, Rhys Jones's work. Uh, and you'll get some sense of the ways in which uh, Jones's work is based upon field work, it's based upon document analysis, it's based upon statistics, as well as a uh, reading of the particular discourse uh, and being attentive to the powers that be. Um, Brown's work is grounded in political theory. She's in, engaging in debates with other political theorists and she is taking certain quotes from figures often very effectively but the you know the degree to which these uh, quotes may actually be cherry picked the degree to which the statistics that she cites which are s- sort of loose um, uh, that that is problematic for for some within social science there's a certain elegance of the theory which obscures 
uh, potentially obscures messy realities, that things are not so cut and dried as, as she um, as she presents. And there, then there would be uh, people who would push back against what they see as a forced feminist reading of uh, borders, seeing them as symbolic compensation for castration, for loss, uh, from conditions of helplessness. There's uh, a tendency, perhaps a tendency towards overstatement. That comes with the territory, so to speak, of political theory. Uh, there are the arguments she makes that uh, you know walls don't work. Uh, of course, is not well accepted. I mean, they, they work for certain groups at certain times on certain issues. Uh, and while she is probably correct in the abstract, they may nevertheless work in, in certain ways. Now, the, the big issue, of course, is suicide bombings in Israel. Um, and the degree to which the um, the wall stopped those or responsible for the um, for the drop in suicide bombings is very contentious uh, and is not uh, to say suicide bombing stopped because the wall was created. Uh, I think is simplifying too much, but one has to nevertheless take into consideration the, the wall as one factor in that. The last problem is a problem which is very evident in the last chapter, and that is it's a you know very provocative and interesting chapter. But what it does is it uh, posits a hegemonic subject, a masculine subject, uh, as being uh, the nation. Uh, there's a sort of unitary psyche, and that psyche is the nation. And of course, you know, in, in one sense, there's no evidence for that. Donald Trump is the nation. Donald Trump was the person that uh, managed to uh, win the U.S. presidency. In, in 2016. Um, but there's massive uh, resistance to Trump. There's no discussion of the resistance of disaggregate, disaggregating the nation into different interest groups, discussing uh, Mexican Americans, discussing lots of people who are pushing back against this desire for the wall. Um, I, now, that is, um, I think, in response, what she would say is that they're nevertheless these things are popular. The people, the politicians who champion them, win elections. Uh, the um, the funds get appropriated in Congress, even though this doesn't work. Uh, even figures like John McCain, who are from the um, border states and are aware of the limitations of borders nevertheless will vote for these things because they satisfy the uh, majority of his electorate uh, and that's not a bad response uh, you know so that is one way in which um, you know there is a um, th th this is convincing uh, that there that this resonates um, and remember, again, t written in 2009, published 2010, uh, and it uh, reads as if it was written in 2016. Okay, so that is a discussion of Wendy Brown's uh, provocative book, uh, Walled States Waning Sovereignty. I've only touched on some of it. The lecture is not a substitute for actually reading uh, the text, which is very, very interesting, uh, and I hope you enjoy it. Okay, thank you, and I will stop here.